This lesson is on commas. Let's get started. All right, we're going to begin by looking at what commas are, then we're going to go over the rules for using commas correctly, and finally, we're going to do some practice. We're going to have some practice sentences, and you're going to figure out where to put the commas. All right, to begin with, what is a comma and what do they do? Well, commas are used within sentences to indicate a pause, shorter than the pause indicated by a period. Ideally, a period indicates that you stop and take a new breath if you were reading these sentences aloud. A comma just indicates that you stop for a moment, but you don't take a new breath. You just kind of mm, pause, on you go. They are most commonly used to clarify sentences by separating wor words that would, without the comma, create other meanings together, altogether, or just be too long to be read comfortably. That's the other thing. Commas will occasionally, you know, break up a sentence so you can go, okay, on we go. What can I say? Reading is a trial for some people. All right, so here are the rules for using commas correctly. First, use commas to separate words, and word groups in a series of three or more. This is the list rule. I went to the grocery store and bought milk, comma, eggs, comma, bread, comma, chicken noodle soup, comma, and broccoli. Now, just so you know, before we get into this, this last comma before the and is what is known as an Oxford comma. You do not technically have to use it. Most of the major style guides now tell you not to use an Oxford comma. Unfortunately, most of the elementary school English teachers still tell you to use it. My rule is just be consistent. So if you're going to use the Oxford comma, go for it. If you're not going to use the Oxford comma, go for it. Just stick to your guns, whatever it is. You also use commas before or surrounding the name or title of a person being directly addressed. In this case, you're basically taking a tangent in the middle of the sentence, taking a little break to say someone's name so they're no, they know they're being talked to. Do you, Timothy, take Susan to be your wife? Yes, Reverend, I do. Timothy is somebody's name, so a minister is performing a, a wedding and he says, do you, Timothy, take Susan? Yes, Reverend, which is his title, I do. So we have the comma, on each side of whatever the break is. Next, use a comma to separate two adjectives when the word and can be inserted between them. So, it was a warm, sunny day. You could easily say it was a warm and sunny day. It can be a warm day and a sunny day at the same time. But, I live in a quiet Chicago neighborhood. You wouldn't say, I live in a quiet and Chicago neighborhood. It may be a quiet neighborhood, and it may be a Chicago neighborhood, but it's not a quiet and Chicago neighborhood. Chicago is not uh, is normally a noun. It only gets used as an adjective it's, if it's right in front of a noun. So you wouldn't say, the neighborhood was quiet and Chicago. That makes no sense. So, no comma. You also use a comma when an L-Y adjective, one that can be used alone with the noun, is used with other adjectives. Make sure that the L-Y adjective is not an adverb. Okay, remember, adverbs very often end with L-Y, but there are some adjectives that do. So, for example, fuzzball is a silly, playful cat. Fuzzball is a silly cat, and he is a playful cat. Silly is an adjective even though it ends in L-Y, so we have a comma between silly and playful. But... I hate reading in dimly lit rooms. Well, dimly, in this case, is an adverb. It ends in L-Y, and it's modifying the adjective lit. How was it lit? Dimly lit. Dimly is not modifying rooms. You wouldn't say, I hate reading in dimly rooms. It makes no sense. So, it's an adverb, not an adjective, and therefore, no comma. All right, use commas to separate the day of the month from the year and after the year, if you then go on with a sentence. If any part of the date is omitted, leave out the comma. So, I met Albert Einstein on December 1st, 1922, in Berlin. We have the complete date, day, month, and year, so we say December 1st, comma, 1922, comma, and we go on with the sentence. But, if I'm leaving out something so minor as the day, I say, I met Einstein in December 1922 in Berlin. No commas whatsoever. Next, use a comma between city and state, and after state, if the state isn't an acronym. So, I visited Cheyenne, Wyoming last year. Cheyenne gets a comma, and Wyoming gets a comma before we go on to last year. But, 
If we're using the postal abbreviation, the acronym WY for Wyoming, then we say, I visited Cheyenne, comma, Wyoming, you still say it, Wyoming, last year, and you don't need a comma after the postal acronym. Is English crazy? Yes, it is. Use commas to surround degrees or titles used with names, but not junior, senior, the second, the third, etc. Uh, essentially, in English, we sometimes like to reuse names, uh, particularly if a, a father names his son after himself, and they have exactly the same name, including middle name, then you know, somebody becomes so-and-so junior. Or if there's already been a junior, then you have so-and-so the third, so-and-so the fourth, and so on. You don't use commas around those but you do use it around degrees or titles. So, John Smith, comma, MD, comma, so we're setting off medical doctor, it's his title, knew James Harkness Jr. Well, Jr. is not a title, it's not a degree, so we just go with James Harkness Jr., no comma. All right, use a comma to set off an expression that interrupts sentence flow. Again, sometimes a pair of commas can be used to indicate a little pause in the sentence, we're going to go off on a sidetrack for a moment and talk about something and then come back. It was, I think, the happiest day of my life. Well, normally the sentence would be, it was the happiest day of my life. But we're taking a little break to say, I think, so we use two commas. Next, when starting a sentence with a weak clause, use a comma after it. Don't use a comma when the sentence starts with a strong clause followed by a weak clause. Okay, what's a weak clause and what's a strong clause? Short version, a weak clause is anything that makes the overall sentence weaker or softer or less emphatic in meaning. A strong clause doesn't do that and it's usually the core of the sentence. So, if you're really worried, I'll call you when my plane lands. Now, if you just say, I'll call you when my plane lands, you're being simple and declarative. But you say, if you're really worried, well, now we're modifying it. We're qualifying it. We're adding a weaker clause. So if we start the sentence with it, we set it off with a comma. If you're really worried, comma, I'll call you when my plane lands. But if we're starting with a stronger bit, I'll call you when my plane lands. If you're really worried, then we don't need the comma. All right. Next, use a comma after phrases of more than three words that begin a sentence. If the phrase has three words or less than three words, the comma is optional. So, to bake the perfect cake, comma, you must have the perfect ingredients. The core of the sentence is you must have the perfect ingredients. We're just adding this little phrase on at the beginning to clarify. So we set it off with a comma because it's more than three words. But on July 4th, Americans set off fireworks. Well, on July 4th, that's three words. So we can do it with or without the comma, they're both correct. On July 4th, Americans set off fireworks. Same thing. Next, if someone or something is sufficiently identified, say by name in a sentence, the description following it is non-essential and should be surrounded by commas. Now, let's look at an example before we get too confused. Nathan, who is six feet tall, ducks under doorways. Well, we've already said Nathan. Usually identifying someone by name is enough to identify them to your typical reader or listener. So, the fact that Nathan is six feet tall is nice to know, but it's not absolutely essential to who we're talking about. You, you, you can pick Nathan out by going, hey Nathan, you don't have to look for the six foot tall guy. But, if you don't use his name, the man who is six feet tall ducks under doorways. Well, if we just say the man, Okay, great, you've narrowed it down to half the human population. But if we say, the man who is six feet tall, we need that to narrow it down a little bit more. So it is an essential clause, and so you don't need to set it off with commas, no commas for that. All right, next, use a comma to separate two strong clauses joined by a coordinating conjunction. And, but, for, nor. Check the lesson on conjunctions in basic grammar if you're lost on those. You can omit the comma if the clauses are short. So, I have written three novels, comma, but he's still working on that short story. Okay, those are two strong clauses. They could be sentences by themselves. So we use the comma and then the but to join them together. But if they're short, I write novels and he writes short stories. Very short, we don't need the comma. You can use it if you really want to, but you don't have to. Next. 
use a comma to separate two independent clauses with a coordinating conjunction if it will help avoid confusion. Now remember, an independent clause has a subject and a verb and could be a sentence all by itself except for that coordinating conjunction. So let's look at our example. I chose the colors blue and green and red was her first choice. So I chose the colors blue and green. That could be a sentence all by itself. But if we didn't have this comma, the sentence would be, I chose the colors blue and green and red was her first choice. Wait, what? At the beginning of that sentence, it sounded like I was saying, I chose the colors blue and green and red. But then we start talking about, was her first choice? Wait a minute, weren't we talking about my choice, not her choice? And it gets confusing. So we stick that comma in there to tell everyone, pause, take half a breath. I chose the colors blue and green, and red was her first choice. Now it's clear, now we understand. All right, I'm about to warn you about a devious and nasty little punctuation error that I never, ever, ever want you to do. It's called a comma splice. It occurs when you join two strong clauses with only a comma instead of using a conjunction, a semicolon, or a period. Comma splices are bad. Never, ever do them. For example, time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana. Well, you don't want a comma to join these two independent clauses. Time flies like an arrow could be a sentence. Fruit flies like a banana could be a sentence. You do not stick them together in one sentence unless you have either a semicolon or a comma and a coordinating conjunction. Only way to do it. Sorry. Too bad, so sad. Only way to do it. It is correct to say, Time flies like an arrow, semicolon, fruit flies like a banana. Now it works. A run-on sentence, which is another error I would very much like you to avoid, is an error that occurs when you join two strong clauses without any punctuation. Basically, you stuck two sentences together and decided to pretend that they were one, and you didn't even use any glue. It's very rude of you. So it is wrong to say, time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana. You notice how my voice speeded up and I sounded like I was running out of breath. Time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana. <gasps> One of the keys to a run-on sentence is if you get to the end and you <gasps> can't breathe, it's probably too long and it might be a run-on. It is correct to say time flies like an arrow, comma, but coordinating conjunction, fruit flies like a banana. So either of these versions of the sentence is right. Either of these versions of the sentence is wrong. Learn it, love it. Next, if the subject does not appear in front of a second verb, don't use a comma. So, he walked inside and took off his coat. He is the subject, but he did two things. He walked and he took, but he only shows up once. Therefore, there should be no comma between he and took anywhere, if you could possibly avoid it. Next, Use commas to introduce or interrupt quotations shorter than three lines. She asked, comma, whose yacht is that? Okay, that's, that's definitely shorter than three lines unless you're typing in very big print. Where, comma, I asked, comma, do you think you're going? Notice that when we are ending the quotation to say something that's not in the quote, we use a comma before a quotation mark. When we are ending the outside bit to go back to the quote, we use a comma and then an open quote. So the comma goes inside the quotation marks at the end and outside at the beginning as necessary. Next, use a comma to separate a statement from a question and to separate contrasting parts of a sentence. So you still like me, don't you? Statement from a question. You still like me, statement. Don't you? Question. We have a comma to separate them. That's your milk carton, statement not mine, contrasting parts of a sentence, so we use a comma. That's your milk carton, not mine, contrast. All right, next, use a comma when beginning a sentence with introductory words such as well, now, or yes. No, I don't have any bananas. No, comma, I don't have any bananas. It's a common introductory word. Use commas to surround interrupters, such as however and therefore. Remember how I talked about when you take this little tangent in the middle of the sentence, take a little break to say something else and then go back? You got to use that pair of commas? Well, it's back. I do, however, have some oranges. No, I don't have any bananas. I do, however, have some oranges. Boy, it's a fruity kind of day in this lesson. Next, use either a comma or a semicolon before introductory words such as namely, 
that is, i.e., for example, e.g., or for instance, when they are followed by a series of items. Use a comma after the introductory, introductory word. I have lots of fruit, semicolon. For example, comma, apples, mangoes, plums, and apricots. Once again, I've left off the Oxford comma. It's perfectly fine. But we have the semicolon before the introductory phrase, for example, and then we have a comma after it. All right. Now that we've absorbed all these rules for commas, let's see if we can put them into practice. Look at these sentences and see if you can figure out where the commas should go. Batman is my favorite superhero. He has all the best gadgets. Okay. What, he cried, do you think you are doing? The box was full of string, yarn, twine, cords, rope, and one very tangled up kitten. British Columbia is a green, rainy province of Canada. If I could travel in time, I would visit Venice, Italy during the Renaissance. The painting was a beautifully colorful portrait. Can you get the door, Melissa? This is Dr. Thomas Wells, PhD. Under the dusty old bed, a mangy old tomcat lurked. And Marine One, which is usually painted green, is the president's helicopter. Take a good look. Pause the video if you need to. Ready? All right. Here is where we find our punctuation. First sentence, Batman is my favorite superhero, semicolon, he has all the best gadgets. Trick question. This one was a run-on sentence. We had two perfectly functional sentences stuck together. Batman is my favorite superhero, and he has all the best gadgets. And if you're going to stick them together and you don't have a coordinating conjunction, such as but and nor, then you have to use a semicolon. If you used a comma, it would be a comma splice. And remember, if you use a comma splice, I will hunt you down. Next, what, comma, he cried, comma, do you think you are doing? This is a case where you're taking a little break from the quote to say something else and then you're going back to it. So you set the break off with commas, one of which goes inside the quotation marks because it's at the end of a quotation, and one of which is out, goes outside because it's at the beginning because quotation marks are apparently very picky. Next, we have a list of things. The box was full of string, comma, yarn, comma, twine, comma, cords, comma, rope, and we left off the Oxford comma again, which is totally fine, and one very tangled up kitten. Now, if you put a comma after rope, that's also totally fine. You can use the Oxford comma, you can leave the Oxford comma out. It's all good. Next, British Columbia is a green, rainy province of Canada. Now, remember, you put the comma between the adjectives if you could put and. You could say, British Columbia is a green and rainy province of Canada. You would have exactly the same meaning, and it would make perfect sense. So, we put the comma in between. Why do we do that, by the way? Because otherwise, you're not sure if they're saying that British Columbia is a province that is both green and rainy, or whether you're saying that British, Can uh, British Columbia is a rainy province which happens to be green. What is a rainy province as distinct from an ordinary province? It gets confusing. So we put the comma in there to keep people from getting mixed up. Next, if I could travel in time. That's a weak clause introducing a strong clause, so we set it off with a comma. I would visit Venice, Italy. You separate the city from the state or country, Venice, comma, Italy, during the Renaissance. Next, the painting was a beautifully colorful portrait. Oh, I got you with this one, didn't I? Beautifully is an adverb modifying colorful, which means it doesn't need a comma after it, at least not between it and the adjective. Now, if you had said silly or lonely or some other adjective involving the, the ending uh, letters L-Y, then you would need the comma. But beautifully is an adverb. You couldn't use it with portrait by itself. You couldn't say it was a beautifully portrait. So you don't need a comma. Next, can you get the door, Melissa? Again, you're setting off that name to indicate that someone's being addressed, so we put a comma before Melissa. You could also say, can you, comma, Melissa, comma, get the door? Works just as well that way. This is Dr. Thomas Wells, PhD. You put a comma before, and if the sentence had gone on afterwards, after, uh, his title, PhD, because that's a degree in academic title. Under the dusty old bed, a mangy old tomcat lurked. Here we have a phrase of more than three words, under the dusty old bed. That's five words long, so we definitely need the comma to give someone's eyes a break before we get to the main sentence, a mangy old tomcat lurked. Finally, marine one, which is usually painted green, is the president's helicopter. Well, frankly, 
Marine One is the name of any helicopter on which the President of the United States is riding. We've already identified it uh, sufficiently because there can only be one helicopter in the world with that name. We've already got it narrowed down to one helicopter, so the fact that it's usually painted green doesn't really help us identify it anymore. We've already got it narrowed down. Therefore, this phrase, which is usually painted green, is non-essential information, so we set it off with commas. And that's all for this lesson. Thank you for watching, 